A welcome to MO Forum and a very special welcome to Professor Hugh White of the Australian National University. Hugh, could you explain why you got into this uh, whole area of strategic relations uh, within our region and beyond? Well, it's a slightly embarrassing answer actually. It's because my dad was in the business. Ah. Uh, he was a senior defence official and I grew up with him talking about this sort of stuff. And I'm ashamed to say it never crossed my mind that I want to do anything else with my life other than this. I think for me it was actually what I think, you know, people in the church call a vocation. Oh. I, I just never thought I wanted to do anything other than Well, my kids have decided uh, one thing they're not going to do, <laughs> <laughs> which is what I did. Out of counter vocation. <laughs> yeah, no, well, for me it really just did, went very deep. I had a very irregular uh, early academic career and, you know, chopped and changed and mucked about, but I always thought that at the end I wanted to this end up working landing, in so. government, working in the foreign affairs and defence area. Um, and uh, that was just because I had this very deep sense of how sort of inherently interesting it was. And then there was there were two other influences. Uh, when I was a sort of a school kid, I came across in the library a short book on the origins of the First World War. I can still picture it. Yeah. It was just a little sort of, you know, almost a pamphlet. I remember reading this, and, you know, Austria uh, delivers an ultimatum to Serbia, Russia mobilizes to support Austria, Russia then mobilizes against Germany, Germany mobilizes against Russia. Just, this was the mm. most interesting mm. thing I'd ever yeah, read. read. I couldn't yeah. believe it. And then the second sort of sp the spark was a couple of years later in my final year at school, I did an 18th century history subject and a wonderful teacher in the first class of the year explained the origins of the war of the Spanish succession. I won't go through it, but it was the most, I remember just thinking, ah, that's just so interesting. Mm. Uh, the same sort of thing. So this yeah, is about yeah. how states relate to one another, the role of armed force in their relationship, what you need to do to preserve a stable order. It sounds sort of corny, but I've always just thought it was the most interesting thing going. Right. And, plus, and I, plus we, I'm sort of interested in machinery as well. So there's big tanks problem. and things. Yeah, like well, that. No, that, actually, that's prefer easily. Yeah, no, no. But, but I've always been interested easily. in the kind of engineering. I don't mean engineering necessarily in a detailed sense, but in, in the end, uh, you know, politics is all about human relations and psychology and all of that. Ultimately, whereas armed force is very physical. Yeah, you know, it's all about it's what you can actually do. Uh, you know, the machines, the systems, the people, how you yeah. can get them into Not places. very subtle. It's not very subtle. And so the interconnection between the sort of mental world of politics and the very okay, physical yeah. world of armed force and how they relate with one another has always seemed to me to be extraordinarily interesting. So, you know, And, and um, the ultimate goal of this, obviously people um, get their motivation yeah. by a particular... Yeah result or outcome they want yeah. to see. Through this, were you trying to work out ways that countries could go to war against each other or ways of avoiding uh, uh, countries going it, to, war, it, to war against each other? Well, it, it, it always seemed to me that, you know, there are two really big questions you've got to ask yourself. Uh, the first is, what are the circumstances under which you do think it's correct to go to war? And how do you make sure if you do, you win? And the second is, how can you make sure that those circumstances don't arise? Yeah. And they are, to me, two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Um, you know, I am... Not for everyone. I mean, no, no, not for everyone. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, in, I'm nobody's idea of a pacifist. I do think there are circumstances in which going to war is the right thing to do. Uh, but I am very conservative about the circumstances under which you should go to war. And I I'm usually, particularly in the last couple of decades, have been on the side of those who said, let's not do this. I, I think armed force is actually a very specialized policy instrument which is good for very few things yeah and the idea you can use armed force to do all sorts of other things like say reconstruct the internal politics of iraq or yeah, afghanistan yeah, yeah, to take yeah. two examples not at random i think i've always thought those were dumb ideas well just a quick question um did you support the war in iraq sounds like the answer to that no, is no i I, al I always argued against the war in iraq um, I, uh, and I argued against it on very straightforward grounds. That is, it seemed to me that it was going to be very easy to remove Saddam Hussein and very hard to replace him, mm. and that the US and its partners, even if it had managed to build a much bigger coalition than it did, simply would not have the military resources to control Iraq after the removal of the, of the existing regime. And even if it had those military resources, which it didn't, it wouldn't have then had, so to speak, the political resources yeah. to rebuild Iraq. 
uh, Iraq's political culture yeah. because you know these things are impossible to impose. Yes. Um, so I always argued against that. I I, I supported the initial uh, in, in intervention in Afghanistan after 9/11 because it did seem to me to be a legitimate thing to do. And Al Qaeda was operating when, when Al Qaeda was there. Out of Afghanistan. Um, uh, I argued very consistently against the subsequent phase, which really ar arose almost sort of spontaneously um, in uh, 2002 and 2003, and then got much bigger after 2005. Of uh, of the the, the large scale in intervention to try and reconstruct Afghanistan, mm. it all that always seemed to me to be uh, well destined to fail, mm. and um, and it has, um, uh, and I think that's I think that's a major failure of strategic policy on the West's part to yeah. allow itself to get yeah. in that sort of situation. But we wouldn't be having this argument about um, Australia's engagement in the Second World War or, or well, the American no, involvement and so on. No, 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 that's exactly right. Uh, you know, that was We're a, under that, attack. That, 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 that was a war you had to fight. Yeah. Um, uh, there, there are things one could have done to prevent it. And that's why I say there are two sides of yeah. the coin. Do whatever you can to prevent it. Right. Then do what it means. <laughs> then do whatever you can to win it. Yeah. Um, also, there's a sort of a third element to it. And that is that, you know, leaving aside the actual occasions where you go to war, States spend a lot of money on defence, mm. um, uh, a, a politically significant amount of money. Uh, you know, a thousand dollars for every man, woman, and child on the continent. In Here in Australia, case, even yeah. now, when our defence spending is really too little, little. Yeah. and it's well, it depends what you want to do. Yeah, yeah. But um, but uh, it's certainly too little to do what the government claims it wants to do. Mm. Um, but that's a lot of money, and so it's always seemed to me extremely interesting to explore how you decide what kind of armed forces a country needs and how much money to spend on them. And of course that involves deciding first and foremost what you want to do with them. And that's, it's, a, it's, it's a classic, you know, the one level is a classic policy process like any other area of public policy. What are you trying to achieve? What are the alternatives? How yeah. much is it going to cost? Are we prepared to spend that kind of money to get that kind of outcome? But it's done in very demanding circumstances. You never know the circumstances under which you might do it. You can't run tests of your policy. Mm. It's not like mm. a pilot program. You've yeah. got a new policy for You homeless. guys attack and then we'll Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's not like, you know, you've got a new policy for homeless kids. So yeah. you say, okay, let's run a pilot program yeah, yeah. in Rockhampton. Yeah. No, you can't. Let's run a pilot program of how we might sink another country's submarines. Mm. You know, it looks bad. Um, so, <laughs> so it's a very intellectually demanding, quite pure intellectual demanding task to work out how governments can make sensible, mm -hmm. contestable, evidence-based yeah. decisions on the sorts of armed forces they need. Particularly when people start thinking about armed forces, they don't really think of them just or even primarily as an instrument of policy. They think of them primarily as a national symbol. Yeah, so they get rem right. And all sides of politics do this. They get remarkably sentimental about them. And they spend billions and billions of dollars on stuff you don't need because they like the look of it. Mm. In any other area of public terrifying. policy, this would be a national scandal. Yeah, yeah. But in defence, it's... You know, well, the biggest and the newest, is exactly. that, is that, about that, that sense? Well, we're, well yeah. and, and it's that, but also, you know, stuff that makes us feel good, mm. you know, that makes us feel good about ourselves. And I think in the end, you've got to take a very cold, instrumental view of armed force. It's a policy instrument. You need it to do some things. You want to work out exactly what it is you want it to do, and you've got to build the forces, which most cost-effectively deliver that. And wars have a nasty habit of not going according to script. So they invariably have don't. Um, you know, all of this um, game plan exactly. or war plan exactly. and have the equipment yeah. ready yeah. for that circumstance, yeah. and it completely a different that's circumstance it. arises, and you find right. that you... Don't need the submarines, yeah. but you could have done yeah. with a lot more aircraft. No, it? that's right. Well, AJP Taylor says that uh, said it in the book about the beginning of the Second World War that that um, uh, everybody um, uh, plans for the wrong war and victory goes <laughs> for the country that plans least well, badly. Well, it adapts to the to, to, oh, to, what to, actually to what's actually best. happening. Um, but, but, I mean, having said that, I, I do think you can do defence policy well. Mm. I don't think Australia's done it well for a long time, but I think you can do it well. I think you can make rational, contestable, uh, evidence-based policy decisions about the kinds of capabilities which are most likely to serve your most important interests. Yeah. Um, but most countries don't do it. And we don't do it. Most other countries don't do it. Sometimes you see a country that does do it well, Singapore, for example, and you think, hmm, I wish we could do that. So I do want to get on to some of the regional yes. issues, but yeah. before we do, uh, can you just amplify on the point that you said we haven't done it well? What what have we done 
in defence policy that um, you know should yeah, have okay. been done. The approach Australia has taken to defence since we came back from Vietnam in the early 1970s has been absolutely framed by the biggest fact in Australia's international setting in those decades, and that is that America's primacy in Asia has been uncontested. Not just that America has been the dominant power in Asia, yeah. but its dominance since 1972, since Nixon went to China, has not been contested by mm -hmm. any other Asian great power. And this is so much part of the world we've lived in, we completely take it for granted. Um, and it's very strongly influenced our defence policy, because when we are a very close ally of a dominant power in the region whose primacy is uncontested, that puts a very low ceiling, both on what we have to do to support our ally. Mm. We've done nothing to support America practically in you know real hard military terms in Asia since 1972, since we came back from Vietnam. It puts a very low ceiling on that, and it puts a very low ceiling of what we have to do by ourselves, because. There's a limit to how bad the region can go for us as long as our, our very close allies are dominant power. Now, my argument is that for a decade or more now, Australia should have been recognising that that is changing. That is, that US primacy in Asia is no longer uncontested. And that we are likely to be living in a region in which we either have to do much more to support our ally mm -hmm. or much more by ourselves. Yeah. Maybe both. Um, and but that's I, expensive. It's extremely expensive. Um, uh, but it's also very demanding as you've got to ask in that sort of circumstance you've got to say well what is it precisely that we would need to do to support our ally in a contested Asia yeah. and what exactly would we need to do by ourselves in a contested Asia we have not asked those questions mm -hmm. and until you ask those questions you can't then say well what's the most cost effective way of achieving those objectives what kind of cap in terms yeah. of operational terms yeah. what kind of operations do you need to undertake what kind of capabilities you need to buy to build those operations how much are they going to cost and so on instead what we've done is to spend a great deal of money on capabilities which simply have no strategic rationale. Uh, in particular, a very high proportion of our investment in the ADF since 2003 has gone on building the capacity to project land forces overseas in cases of major war. And this is something which makes no sense for Australia for two very simple reasons. The first is that Australia's land forces will never have a significant strategic impact in Asia in anything we just other. don't have enough. We're soldiers. just we're just not big enough. Mm. You, you know, we just we're just not that kind of country. Yeah. Um, you, you know, a, a a battalion, a brigade, even of a division of Australian soldiers in any major conflict in Asia mm. is delivered Tiny. with a with you know with a with an eyedropper mm. uh, into a bonfire. Yeah. Just disappears. Has no effect at all. Uh, second, of course, they'd never get there. Because we're moving into an Asia in which countries will find it very easy to sink ships and very hard to keep their ships afloat. And we're an island. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> we, they will know we're coming. They'll know we're coming. Yeah. And, and so, you know, the, the investment in the air warfare destroyers and the big amphibious ships and the reshaping of the army as primarily an amphibious force is a huge waste of money. That, that, is, that is fundamentally misconceived piece of strategic planning. It started... With the Howard government, they completely lost discipline in their force planning in 2003, um, and that that has rolled on. And so, there's 15 billion bucks worth of um, of investment there, straight off the pin. That you'd say is wasted. Which I say is just wasted. Now, it's, we we do need some amphibious capability. We don't need amphibious capability for major combat. Right. And so we don't need 27,000 ton amphibious ships. We need 12,000 ton amphibious right. ships to do um, what? Stabilisation operations like the things we did in East Timor, and the Solomon Islands, yeah. and potentially in Papua New Guinea, and so on. But those are operations in uncontested waters. Yeah, yeah. So Understood. you don't have to defend those ships yeah. against somebody else's submarines. Yeah. And they're and they're operations in which you're not trying to put forces ashore against opposition. Yeah. You need a big ship like that if you're going to try and land with, 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 with somebody else's army right. ashore yeah. trying to stop you. Yeah, but if you're going ashore in East Timor or the Solomon Islands. It's a it's it's a lodgment, not an assault. Yeah, yeah. in military terms, that's the sort of way. Them so you wouldn't be a big fan of any of the white papers since two thousand and three. Uh, no, I mean I'm you know you don't want to take my word for this because I was a principal author of the one in two thousand, so I've got a dog in the fight. But 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 I I think the white papers since then have come have first of all failed to address the challenges of the emergence of a contested strategic environment in Asia, which is the strategic challenge Australia faces, and secondly have failed uh, to generate a rational force structure um, 
and so we're now in a situation, to be blunt, in which the, the defence funding projections can't, will not be able to support the capabilities we're, taught, we're, we're planning to buy. The capability we're planning to buy won't be able to deliver the operational objectives we've set ourselves, and the operational objectives we've set ourselves are in, insufficient to achieve our strategic objectives. But apart from that, it's apart all from right. that, we're in great shape. <laughs> okay, so a lot of money um, expected to fund these things. The money's not there. The, 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 money, the, the money, money, if it was there, we're buying the wrong things. You're buying the wrong. Yeah. Things. So you know, and yeah, you, know, you can waste money in defence in a million different ways, but there's no worse way of wasting money than spending billions of dollars on stuff that's not going to work for yeah. you. And, and, that is, and that is what we're doing at the moment. And of course, at the same time, we're not spending money that we do need to spend. I, you know, I, I think it, Australia has a real challenge as to whether it's going to, whether it can sustain the armed forces required to give it the military weight of a, of a middle power in the Asian century in a contested Asia. But I think we probably can do it, but only if we define what we need to do very narrowly and precisely and build exactly the capabilities that most cost effectively mm -hmm. deliver those things we need to do. And to, to, for me, I mean, it's a long argument, but for me, the um, the heart of that is uh, a submarines. I, I would have a submarine force two or three times the size of, that uh, that anyone's now planning, but I'd also start building it now. Yeah. Um, you know, the fact is that we have uh, allowed ourselves to drift into a situation where the replacement of the old columns has been deferred and deferred and deferred. Yeah. Um, and we're going to find ourselves two or three decades from now with a vastly depleted submarine force. We should have a vastly expanded. And what do you do with submarines? I mean, what, what's the advantage for okay. Australia? The, the key operational role for Australia is the capacity to stop other people using the sea against us. Mm -hmm. Going back to the fact we're an island. Yeah, uh, very important. So this is a and this is, is not a projection. This well, is a defence. No, well, it's it, it's 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 a strategic posture which is fundamentally defensive. Yeah, it's not to say it's strategically defensive. Not to say it's operationally defensive. Your strategic objective can be to defend your own territory. Yeah, you can do it by reaching out and touching the other bloke. Right. But the core thing that Australia needs to be able to do is sink other people's ships. This mm -hmm. sounds like an oversimplification. Mm -hmm. It's not. This stuff actually is much simpler than most people make it out to be. We need to be able to sink other people's ships. And With good reason, I hope. Oh, yes. No, no. Well, we, <laughs> under the right circumstances, you know, like I said, go back to the beginning. Yeah. You need to make sure you don't get yourself in that situation. Yeah. And we'll come on, get, back, get back to that later. But once you find yourself in that situation, yeah. you want to make sure you can do it. Do what you... Well, you want to raise the costs and risks to an adversary to the point of, where they yeah, just yeah. say it's not worth it. We may not do that. Um, a middle power like Australia, we don't win wars. Mm. We avoid losing them. Yeah. That's the difference between a great power can win a war. Mm. You know, march its soldiers down the main street of its adversary, march across Tiananmen Square. We're never going to march yeah. across Tiananmen Square. Um, neither will America, by the way. Yeah. But we're, we're not, we're not, you don't win wars. What you do is avoid losing them. And I think the best way for Australia to avoid losing them is to be able to sink other people's ships. And although submarines are not the only thing to do that, I also think air power is very important. Submarines are by far and away the most cost-effective way to sink ships at long range from your own territory uh -huh. because they're so hard to find and sink themselves. Yeah. Um, and they have very long range and so on. So I'd, I'd, I'd build 24 or 36 submarines and do it fast. Well, the people of Adelaide would love you. <laughs> well, they, 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 they would. Um, and actually, although I'm not... I'm a I'm very stringent about defence industry. I, mm. You know, I, I'm not one of those who believes that everything has to be built in Australia. But as a matter of fact, I think because our submarines capability is, needs to be so big, it would actually be cost effective for us to build, uh, to, to run a continual build probe. In fact, probably to meet my strategic plan, you probably need two yards building continuously. Right. Yeah. It's not that bad a model. I mean, it's, it's, it sounds ludicrously ambitious. Actually, if you have two yards more or less side by side building continuously, you can you can build submarines quite cheaply. And why not off the shelf? Uh, well, um, I, I, I would... It's a big shelf, by the way. Yeah, big shelf. Um, uh, I don't at all rule out the idea of buying, um, of buying off the shelf submarines. Um, and the, a point will come in the not too distant future where our submarine situation is so critical of the we only way that we, the, the only thing is going to be to go to Kiel or something to Germany to fill the gap, the whole to fill, to fill the gap the retirement. And although there are disadvantages with European boats, particularly because of their size and therefore their range and endurance, um, I think those disadvantages are not as great as. Uh, their critics sometimes say, because mm -hmm. most of their critics are motivated by a deep desire to build lots of stuff in Australia, in Australia. Um, sometimes not unconnected with yeah. uh, incentives. Um, uh, I think there are, uh, I think that, that could be 
a necessary and practical step, but in the long term, it makes sense for Australia to have bigger submarines. We have a huge investment in the intellectual property of the columns. Mm. We know what's wrong with the columns. Yeah. Um, the, by far and away, the most natural thing for us to do is to take the Collins design as a starting point and evolve that design, fix the problems. It's not, and it's basically, it, it remains a pretty good boat. Mm -hmm. There are some problems, you know, some of them are ridiculously fundamental, but they're, they're, they're solvable. So I think building on the intellectual property we've already got, starting to build an, an evolved version of the Collins, if it was me, I'd order six. I'd start building six evolved columns as right now at the same time as we're running the through life upgrades, the, the life of type extensions on the existing six columns. Then I'd do another evolution of that design and then start building that one really fast. But Well, I think that gives us a pretty yes. good um, <laughs> tour of uh, our defence posture and the sort of equipment and so on that would be needed. But I know that you have attracted the ire yes. of um, other... Um, Self-professed learned commentators, yes, yes, some of them yes, are learned. Yes. 